So my name is Megan. I don't know who follows me or not, but on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, I go by Living the Height Life because my last name is Height and it's all about us living our life. So we are an off-grid homestead in South Carolina. We got started with meat rabbits when we were looking to be more sustainable on how to raise our own food. And y'all, rabbits are the easiest way to do that. I recommend rabbits to absolutely everybody. They are easy to reproduce. They grow very fast. They put out as much meat as chickens do. And you don't have to deal with the whole mess that you have with chickens. Chickens will scratch everything up. They get out, they fly around. They're mean, they scratch. Roosters are mean. We don't have that issue with our rabbits. So rabbits are always much better, in my opinion. Carolina. It's outside of Dillon, South Carolina, so we're out headed towards the coast, headed towards Bartle Beach. And right now we don't sell any rabbits. I know that's a common question I get. My hope is to start that next year. We are working on growing our own line of rabbits that thrive on forage. So our rabbits don't receive any commercialized pellets. They receive stuff we grow, hay, some alfalfa, some sunflower seeds, some oats, things like that. And I do have a book called Feeding Meat Rabbits for Free that tells you everything you can feed your rabbits and how to meet their nutritional requirements. And that is inside of my food. So if you have any questions on that, feel free to come talk to me about that. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to give y'all a little bit of a history on rabbits. So a lot of people don't know. Rabbits were first discovered in 1000 BC in what we now know as Spain. Spain is named after rabbits because there were so many rabbits in Spain. And that's where they were first discovered. From there, they went to the Roman Empire where they were raised in what they called rabbit gardens. So they would catch rabbits, put them in enclosed spaces, and then go out and hunt them. So that's where our rabbits started being raised for meats. In 500 AD, so we went a long time of rabbits in rabbit gardens, 500 AD, they began being raised by French monks in the south of France. And that's where rabbits became domesticated. In 500 AD, they started breeding them for specific traits. We got our different breeds. Rabbits have a long history of being raised for meat. They have not been pets for very long, I promise. So after that, they were raised by the wealthy. Rabbits were seen as a wealthy hobby and a wealthy meat source. It was not normal for common people to have rabbits. It was an exotic meat. Rabbits weren't raised by everyday people until the 1700s. They come to the United States, or back then the colonies, in the 1890s. And since then, they have started being raised by common people. You can see them everywhere. In 1928, a rabbit research facility was developed in California. And that is when rabbit pellets were designed. 1928. From 1928 to 1964, they researched rabbits to find what were the best breeds for meat, how to raise them the best way, and how to feed your rabbits and grow them fast on a commercialized pellet so that it was convenient. So rabbits began way, way back, began being raised by monks in 580 for meat, but rabbit pellets did not even come around to the 1928, thousands of years later. So rabbit pellets are not necessary to raise rabbits. So anybody who looks at rabbit pellets and says, I can't raise rabbits because that's expensive, throw that out the window because you don't need them. Everybody can raise rabbits. You can forage for rabbits. You can grow in your garden for rabbits. They are easy. They are kid friendly. Our son helps raise rabbits and he's four. So anybody can do it. They are the one animal you can have no matter where you're at, in the urban area, in the rural area, and everybody can do them and they produce a ton of meat. So I recommend everybody start out with a trio of rabbits. That's two does and one buck because you can then breed that one buck to those two does. Those two does, we breed six times a year. Our does average seven kits per litter. So seven times six, each doe can give you 48 kits on average a year. So if you have two of those, and you grow them out to five pounds of harvest meat, you can get as much from rabbits in one year as you can get from one cow. So anybody can raise rabbit meats, and it is delicious. I have a cookbook coming out this year to tell you how to cook rabbits. It is delicious. It tastes very similar to chicken. You can use it in most chicken dishes, so don't be afraid of rabbits. When you're getting into rabbits, I want you to ask three questions to yourself. How are you going to house them? How are you going to feed them? And how are you going to breed them? Those are the main questions you want to know. Housing first. Are you going to cage raise them, colony raise them, or rabbit tractor raise them? We currently have a colony and a rabbit tractor. 
We are putting in a cage system this year so I can grow rabbits in all three settings and teach people how to grow them in all three settings. But our colony is an eight foot by 16 foot area. It's wide open. Our rabbits live together. They cuddle together. They raise their kits together. I know a lot of people are worried about bugs killing kits and other does killing kits. If you have a buck who kills your kits, you have a bad buck. Get ready, get a new one. My kits and my rabbit tractors will crawl in next door to a buck and they'll cuddle. They did it the other night. Ain't even their daddy. And they still cuddle with him and he's nice as can be. Loves them. So if you have a bad buck who kills your kids, get rid of him. Start over. Rabbits grow too fast to keep bad animals. If you're going to cage raise them, that's great. But look at your breeds of rabbits because some breeds of rabbits don't do, get, don't do very well on cage wire. Flemish giants are too heavy. You put them on cage wire, you're going to get sore feet. A lot of other breeds are the same way, so you want to look into your breeds first and then decide if you want to cage raise them or not. Rabbit tractors are one of my favorite ways to do them because you move them every single day. You're spreading that rabbit manure out across your property. You're fertilizing your soil. Your soil grows food for your rabbits, so it's a cycle of life. So where our orchard is going right now, that's where my rabbits are. So they're fertilizing that soil. I'll put in my plants. They'll grow up. They'll feed my rabbits. I take all of my rabbit bedding from my colony and throw it in my garden. I grow food for my rabbits in my garden, but my rabbits feed my garden. So it's an endless cycle. It is like the most sustainable animal you can ever get. I promise. They are awesome. And then it comes down to breeding your rabbits. So how often do you want to breed? How many do you want to breed? Because rabbit math is real, guys. We started out with three, and we have over 20 right now. Um, and then breeding stubborn rabbits is always the main issue. People say rabbits breed like rabbits, but they don't always. Rabbits can be difficult to breed sometimes. So that's one of the main things that we need to cover. Rabbits don't have a heat cycle like other animals. So with goats or something, you're watching for them to come into heat and you put your butts with them and they breathe. Rabbits aren't like that. They don't have a heat cycle. Rabbits ovulate when they're being bred and after they're bred. So when you get your butt and your doe together and they mate, that's when she ovulates and there on after for the next eight hours she'll ovulate. And so you reproduce or you have them get together a few times. We go for at least three fall offs. And if you've never seen rabbits mate, the bug literally falls off the dough. That's how you know it's successful. It's pretty comical. A lot of times they will scream when they do it. So it's very dramatic. It is very dramatic, but they use so much force, the thrust, that they literally just fall down. So it's pretty funny, but you want at least three fall offs when you mate your does. More is better because she's gonna release those eggs and she releases a lot of them and you want all of them fertilized as much as possible. So three fall-offs. If they don't get those three fall-offs, try again the next day. If your doe will not lift for your rabbit, meaning she won't breed with it, try again the next day. While rabbits don't have a heat cycle, their hormones fluctuate. And so they have about 12 days of high hormones and about four days where hormones are low. And so those four days where hormones are low, your doe's not gonna wanna lift for your butt because she's not in the mood. So if you keep trying, You've got four days of like, she's not gonna lift. You don't know what day in that four days you're gonna hit. So try again each day for four days. I guarantee you by that fourth day, she's gonna lift for him. If she don't, then you've got a bad doe and you need to get rid of her or replace her. We don't keep any bad breeders on our homestead. Our does produce big, beautiful, healthy kits. And that's how we know they're good breeders. Um, and they produce a lot of kits. I've got two that are due, you know, in the next few weeks. And I just had kits not too long ago. We breed our does back when our kids are three weeks old. So being pregnant is not hard on your does. You can breed them as much as you want. It's the lactating that is hard on your does. So when they are actually producing milk for their kids. So we wean our kids at six weeks. If she's struggling feeding her kids, we start weaning them at four. At four weeks, your rabbits are eating their own food. Whether you're feeding them a fresh food diet or a pelleted diet, that's completely up to you. We do fresh foods and they're eating those at four weeks. Um, but the one thing I want to tell you about that is whatever you're feeding your dough is what you feed your kids until they are at least eight weeks old. Kids have a lot of issues with bloat. So just like cows, they bloat. The difference is rabbits can't vomit and they can't release gas through their windpipe. It all has to come out the other way. So if they can't pass anything, then they bloat up and it can kill them. So you don't change a rabbit's food source from what the doe is eating until the kids are at least eight weeks old and they can handle that change. They learn from eating mom's poop what is good for their cells and what their bacteria can digest um, because all that bacteria comes from mom's poop. Rabbits eat their own poop as well. So if you did not know that, I am here to tell you it's kind of gross. 
<laughs> That's where they get most of their vitamins and minerals from is their own poop. It's a special poop called Cicatropes and they produce it about five hours after they eat their meals and they eat it straight out of their butts. Uh, but it gives them all their vitamins and nutrients that they need to survive. That's why we can feed them on a forage diet is because they produce a lot of what they need themselves. And what they don't, we produce for them. So we produce fresh foods. Herbs are my favorite. If you can grow herbs, you can feed your rabbits fresh foods, even in an urban setting. I recommend people get green stalks and fill it full of herbs. Your herbs are nutritionally dense, plus they're good for the immune system. They're going to boost that immune system and give you healthier rabbits. Yes, ma'am. Basil is one of my favorites because it acts as an antibiotic and antifungal and antimicrobial. If you've got a sick rabbit, you feed it all the basil you can get it to eat. Oregano, rosemary, thyme, basic herbs, they're great for your rabbits. Um, you can branch out from there and go into things like comfrey, fantastic. Um, let's see, basically any herb you can think of. Mint is the only one I recommend you be very, very careful with because mint will dry up lactating doughs. So if you've got a mama in milk, don't feed her mint because it'll dry her up. However, if you have a mama who lost her litter, feed her mint and then that will dry her up so that you're not getting mastitis. So that's really the herb you be careful with. Anything you cook with, you can give to your rabbits. And that's and if you want to dry them, I feed dry herbs all winter long. So when they're in peak production, I cut them down, I hang them up to dry, and I feed them all winter. That way I can keep their immune systems high even through the winter when most people are getting sick. And rabbits do get sick. They even get a cold. It's called snuffles. And it is a bacteria produced cold. And it causes the runny nose and the gunky eyes. Basically like you have a cold, but it's highly contagious. So at that point, you want to feed a lot of herbs to build up that immune system to fight off that bacteria and get your rabbits back healthy. Um, but yeah, a lot of herbs. Trees are another one. If you've got trees on your homestead, just about all trees can be fed to rabbits. Your good rule of thumb is if a tree loses its leaves in the winter, it's a pretty good bet it can be fed to your rabbits. The one caveat to that is stone fruit trees. So peach trees, apricot trees, anything with a solid, solid seed in the middle, one seed. That's a stone fruit. Those trees, their tree leaves and limbs contain cyanide in them. So you gotta let them set for 30 days before you can feed them to your rabbits. Um, pine is another one I see a lot of people feed to their rabbits. Pine has to set 30 days before you can feed it to your rabbits because it has so many phenols in it that it can cause respiratory issues. The one tree, and I know it don't lose its leaves in the winter, but if you learn nothing else from me today, keep cedar trees away from your rabbits. I know they sell cedar bedding at the pet stores, don't give it to your rabbits. Cedar causes respiratory issues in your rabbits. And even people who have pet rabbits who use cedar bedding, over time they'll notice their rabbits getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And it's because the rabbits are breeding in those phenols from that cedar. And it causes their immune system to be depressed and they will die eventually. Um, so never, never put cedar near your rabbits. Most other trees are okay. Yes, they do sell cedar rabbit nesting boxes. Please don't buy those. I don't know who come up with that as for rabbits, and I don't know why they didn't do their research, but even kiln dried cedar still has too many phenols in it, it'll make your rabbit sick. So just, I don't know. I don't know who comes up with that for pet stores, but please stay away from cedar for your rabbits. Um, but most other things we do feed to our rabbits. I forage a lot of wild weeds, so your wild weeds are gonna be more nutritionally dense than anything you're gonna grow in your garden. They are fantastic. Everything that you think you don't want on your property, I guarantee you your rabbits can eat it. Wild brambles for blackberry and raspberry bushes that just grow wild all over the place are one of the best things you can feed to your rabbits. They are great for the immune system. Raspberry leaves are great for anything that is pregnant because it tones the uterus and helps make labor go easier. It's even great for people. If you're having kids drink raspberry leaf tea before you go into labor your last trimester, it's good for your uterus. It is fantastic, but it's great for your rabbits too. I give all of my pregnant does raspberry leaves and blackberry leaves in their last week of pregnancy because it just helps them have a smoother labor. And I mean, rabbit labor lasts 15 minutes. It's over before you even know it. 15 minutes, so the faster you can get it done, the faster those babies come out, the better you're gonna be. Uh, but they can, I mean, they can have 12 babies in 15 minutes. So oftentimes we don't know our rabbits are in labor until we go out there and we're like, oh, hey, we got babies on the ground. How about that? Um, and so for people who do raise rabbits or anybody looking into rabbits, you're gonna wanna have nest boxes in with your rabbits when they go into labor. 
You can buy fancy nest boxes. You can buy cedar nest boxes. The nest box that I recommend is a five gallon bucket. Like that's what we use for all of our rabbits, five gallon buckets. For smaller rabbits, we just do stand up buckets and cut a hole in them. The bugs and stuff, we use those as their own little nest box in the winter, they're happy. For our does who are having kits, we turn the bucket on its side, put the lid on it, cut a hole in it, and she goes in there. It acts like a burrow. They feel safe, they feel confined. We have never had kits born outside of the nest boxes while using five gallon buckets. Many people who use boxes that have open tops will have kits that are born on the ground, they'll have kits that are born on the wire, and they don't make it because they get cold. A bucket acts as a natural burrow. She can go in there, she can hide, she feels safe from predators, and we have never had kits born outside of a bucket. It is the easiest nest box you can buy. You can get them at Lowe's, Home Depot, wherever, they're like five bucks. And they are safe, they're easy to sanitize, you can clean them out, they're safe, they're fantastic. So that's what my main recommendation is for nest boxes. So I don't build them to sell them because you can just make them yourself. It's so super easy. Yes, sir. I you can. I leave the handles on them because they're easy to pick them up, and transport them. Um, but just put the handles to the top because if you put them on the bottom, they're gonna chew on them. Yeah. So I just flip them over the top. Super easy. Anybody have any other questions? I do have a book. Yep, she's got it right there. It's called Feeding Meat Rabbits for Free. It goes over 125 things you can grow and forage for your rabbits. It's inside. I'm signing them all day long. I got them for sale. They're also on my website and Amazon. So if you want to get them later, that's fine. I have two books coming out this year. So one is a cookbook. And this is actually the first time I've basically announced it out in public. I had a bunch of rabbit trees that are really good friends of mine submit their favorite recipes along with my favorite recipes. And we have produced a rabbit cookbook that has recipes from all over the United States that have all different kinds of way of cooking. I've got smoked rabbit recipes, grilled rabbit, uh, buffalo rabbit dip, which is fantastic, rabbit fritters, which is our favorite way to do it, uh, apricot glazed rabbits, rabbit tacos, I mean, basically anything you can think of because there's going to be something in there for everybody who wants to try rabbit. It is fantastic. So that one is set to come out June 1st. And then I have another book that comes out October 1st. It is called The Homesteader's Guide to Raising Rabbits from Birth to Butcher. And it goes from everything. We're starting at the beginning of how to select your breeders, what breeds are best, how to raise them up, what housing to use for them, week by week throughout the rabbit's life, what sicknesses you can expect, what you can expect them to do in those weeks, all the way up to how to butcher, and a few recipes in there as well to how to raise your rabbits. So it is gonna be the one-stop guide to raising rabbits. And that is what I want, because I haven't found a book out there that covers everything for about rabbits that isn't, bias and say you have to raise them in a commercial setting because I don't believe that. They haven't been raised in a commercial setting for thousands of years. Anybody can raise rabbits no matter where you're at and no matter what setting you're in. So you don't have to have a big commercial barn with uh, AC or anything. We're off grid. Our rabbits don't have any AC. They, they live in the heat and they are fine. Yes, sir. Absolutely. It is just, it's actually one of them. It's a converted chicken tractor. And the only thing we do different with our rabbit tractors is you have to put some kind of bottom on them to keep your rabbits from digging out. So we use one inch slats and they're spaced one and a half inches apart. Wooden slats across the bottom. It slides easier that way because it's not getting caught up on a lot of things and they can't dig out but they can still get to the grass. That's the only difference in a rabbit tractor and a chicken tractor. Oh. <laughs> But that's our favorite way, and we even have one that's a breeding tractor that is split two thirds down, so it has a doe in her kit, and one that has a, and it has a buck on the other side. It's got the whole thing in there. You can start breeding your rabbits in there. You can graze your grow outs out till you wean them, and then move them on. I sure do. I have pictures of how to build it and how to use it, all in my book. Yes. Oh yeah. So processing rabbits. Rabbits have a lot of fur. And if you're in a windy day and you're cut through that fur, guess what? It blows all over the place. I, I totally understand that. And once rabbit fur is on meat, it's hard to get off. So our number one tip when you're processing rabbits is to dunk your rabbit in water. So you've got your rabbit, it's dead, you've called it, dunk it in water before you cut. That sticks that fur to the body instead of getting on your meat. 
I even sometimes if I don't have a big pail, I'll take a spray bottle out there and spray the carcass down before I cut into it and that keeps the fur from flying all over the place. But yeah, that's absolutely. And while we're talking about tips for processing rabbits, the good thing to know about processing rabbits is you want that rabbit to set for 48 hours before you cook it. A lot of people talk about aging cows for weeks. Rabbits only need two days. 48 hours. We set it in cold storage. So I butcher my rabbit. I get my rabbit meat. I stick it in a salt water bath for one hour just to kind of get okay. the blood out of it. And then I just dry it off and stick it in the fridge in a Tupperware container for two days. After that, you can cook it. You can freeze it, whatever you want. But that allows the meat to get more tender because rigor has passed. And so it's tender for you. If you are raising older rabbits and you notice that they're tough, you'll want to brine your rabbit before you cook it. I brine them for about 12 hours before I cook them when that softens that meat up. So you can still grill older rabbits because it's more tender after you brine it. Yes, ma'am? Um, so our rabbit tractor, we've never had an issue with any kind of predators with it. What we have done is we have done a two layer fence system so it's got two by three welded wire on the outside because it's stronger and that way it can keep the bigger predators away and then we have lined the inside of that with hardware cloth to keep the smaller predators away so different foxes and raccoons and stuff can't get into our rabbits um, and then when it sets on the ground you know they can try to dig under but rabbit tractors have those slats so they can't dig under and get up to your rabbits so we have had less issues with predators in our rabbit tractors than we did in our chicken tractor yeah Another reason rabbits out beat chickens every day. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh man, that's the question. How many rabbits do I have? Currently, I have two, five, seven, eleven, about fifteen, and two litters due soon. So, so rabbits. Our rabbit breeds that we raise, we have New Zealands and we have Californians. Now, if you're wanting to get started. New Zealand's are always my go-to rabbit. They're the best rabbit to start out with. They have a high meat to bone ratio. What that means is they put on more meat than they do bones within their first 12 weeks of life. A lot of people wanna go for the giant breeds, the Flemish giants, because they get big. Flemish giants can get huge. There is no max weight standard on a Flemish giant. They can get 20 pounds, but their bones are huge. So they are, when they're maturing, they're putting all that food you're giving them into their bones before they put it into their meat. So Flemish giants can take forever to grow out and they take forever to reach maturity. Some of them don't reach maturity until they're a year old. Our New Zealand's, we start butchering at 16 weeks because we want to save their pelts and the pelts are stronger at 16 weeks. If you're not saving the pelts, 12 weeks is the best time to butcher them and their meat is higher than their bones. We get a 50% dress out rate for our rabbits. So we get 50% meat after we butcher our rabbits. So if we have an eight pound rabbit in 12 weeks, we get four pounds of meat off of it in 12 weeks. So it's pretty comparable to chickens. Um, but New Zealand are always, always my go-to. They're great moms, they grow great and everything. Yes. Yep, they're the same. Red and whites are the same. New Zealand whites became popular because back in the days where they dyed pelts, whites took dye better and they made better jackets and stuff out of rabbit pelts with the whites. So that became the commercial meat standard because when they slaughtered the rabbits, then they took all the pelts and sent them to the fur industry and the fur industry made clothes out of them. So it came, became a double standard there. But they're the same. Red and whites are all the same. Yes, ma'am? Um, how big are your rabbits when you butcher them? My rabbits, when I butcher them, they're about 12 to 16 weeks, depending on, you know, if we're saving their pelts or not. And they're about this big. So they weigh about nine pounds. Um, the New Zealand's max weight on them, on average, according to breed standard, is 12 pounds. So they get very, very large. And they do that by maturity. So rabbits meet maturity at 16 weeks. At 16 weeks, your rabbits commercial meat breeds anyways, can start reproducing. Four and a half months is usually the commercial standard for reproducing your rabbits. A lot of times we wait till six months just because the does get bigger and they can handle birth a little bit better and they keep condition better when they're pregnant, but <laughs> they can do it at 16 weeks. Um, so they reproduce fast, they grow fast. Their gestation is 31 days. So from the day you breed them, 31 days, you should have kids. 
We've had one occasionally go 41 days, but that is very rare. Usually ours is always 31 days on the mark. 31 days every time. And then those kids, we wean them at six weeks. By the time she's already pregnant, she's gonna have another litter a week later, and they grow up, and we just repeat the cycle. We breed all the way from fall, winter, and spring. So this, our recent litter that will be coming due in the next few weeks will be our last litter, because rabbits don't handle heat very well. So we're hot, we're the south, we're very, very hot. Rabbits can't sweat. So they release all of their heat through their ears, so that's why rabbits have big, beautiful ears. In the south, you want your rabbits to have even bigger ears, so always breed for bigger ears because they can let off more heat and they can stay healthier through the summer that way. Now, there is one breed that's called a Tamuk breed. It stands for Texas A&M University of Kingsville, and that rabbit is specifically bred to withstand heat. But that rabbit is specifically bred to withstand heat in a commercial setting. We have tried that breed and it did not do well on the ground, but if you're gonna do cages, a Tamuk breed would do good for you, but they just did not handle the bacteria on the ground very well. They've, that's been bred out of them. They've been bred for commercial aspects. Um, but yeah, do you have a question? Um, yes, so uh, we live in Kansas. So, okay. So uh, but how, do you, how do you have to survive during the winter? Do you have to cover them all the time? Or? Nope. Rabbits come with their own fur coat. So all you have to do is provide a place for them to get out of the out of the wind. That's all they need. They even our babies, we breed all year long in freezing temperatures. We've had snow on our rabbit tractors and our babies are nice and warm. Because rabbit fur is warmer than wool. So your mama doe when she's pregnant, right before she has her babies, she will pull her own fur out. Usually they pull it out from their chest, their abdomen, their lower back area. And that's what she puts around her babies and it keeps them insulated and keeps them warm. If you have a rabbit, and it happens a lot with first time moms, who does not pull her own fur out, you need to pull it out for her and that teaches her to do it. It's not gonna hurt her. Rabbits release a hormone that causes their fur to basically fall out. So it's real easy, you'll pull out whole tufts just gently and put it in there and that teaches her to do it for the next time around. Sometimes first time moms just don't get the picture. I don't know what it is, but if you do that, that insulates those babies. Literally all they need is a windbreak to keep the wind off of them. And they'll just get in their bucket burrows. That's all we provide in the winter is our little five gallon bucket burrows. They get in there when they're cold and they're fine. Now if you live like way north where it's like very, very, very cold, we're talking about negative degrees, you would need wind blocks all the way around. But for us, we just provide one area of a wind block and they love it. The problem with rabbits is always the heat. The heat in the summer. So. Um, if you're like us and you're off grid, you're not providing AC for your rabbits, or if you just don't want to provide AC for your rabbits, what we recommend is tiles. You can get them at Lowe's, just ceramic tiles, and your rabbits will lay on them, and that will cool them off. Um, they will cool off on their bellies, and then of course they got the big ears, and so as blood circulates through their ears and the wind blows, it cools their blood off and it cools them off. Um, some people shave their rabbits in the summer. We don't, we don't do that. I don't see any point. We breed our rabbits to be what we need them to be. So if we have a rabbit that does not do well in the heat, we don't breed that rabbit. It goes to freezer camp and it becomes dinner. Um, so breed your rabbits to what you want to breed. If you have sick rabbits, don't breed them. Breed your healthy rabbits because you want your rabbits to be healthy. If you have rabbits that don't handle the heat, don't breed them. Breed the ones that handle the heat. And the more you breed them into what you want, then the better your rabbits are going to be. And that's what we're currently doing on our homestead is we're breeding Bigger, better meat rabbits is what I say. Bigger, better meat rabbits. So we're breeding them healthy. We're breeding them to withstand heat. We're breeding them to produce large litters often to be good moms, to be easy to breed. If a rabbit is difficult to breed, they get out of our breeding program. We don't even keep them anymore. We only want to keep the biggest and the best because our goal is to produce lines of rabbits that we can sell to y'all so you can get started right off the street have you a trio of rabbits and you don't have to stress because you know you're going to get a healthy line of rabbits that breed easy for you, grow big, and are just great overall. So that's my goal. Alright friends, well that's all I have for you today. I am so thankful for each of you who come out to see me at the Farm Where You Live event in Nashville, North Carolina. I hope to see you at the next event, so make sure you are subscribed to the channel and you're following me on my website so you can see when I post the next dates for the next event and what I will be speaking on. But until next time, friends, bye. I will see you later.